Hello, and welcome to Short Stories, brought to you by the National Taichung University of Science and Technology Language Center. Do you like science fiction? Do you like guns? Well, if you do, you will enjoy today's short story, which is based on the book From the Earth to the Moon by Jules Verne. Jules Verne was a French novelist who lived in the 19th century. He was a prolific writer with dozens of novels, plays, and poems to his credit. His most famous books can be found in the Voyages Extraordinaires series, like Journey to the Center of the Earth, 20,000 Leagues Under the Seas, and Around the World in 80 Days. All these stories have been turned into a movie or TV show at some point. Perhaps you've seen some of them. I chose today's short story, From the Earth to the Moon, for two reasons. First, Jules Verne actually calculated what it would take to reach the moon, and he wasn't too far off. That's pretty impressive when you consider that he published this book in 1865. Second, Verne's descriptions of Americans and their love of guns were too apt to ignore. I found this story to be pretty funny. Vocabulary Sine qua non Sine qua non A medical license is a sine qua non for any doctor. Artillery Artillery The enemy artillery devastated the town. Projectile Projectile The tank was destroyed by a powerful projectile. To the bone To the bone The handsome rebel was bad to the bone. Prick up one's ears. Prick up one's ears. The students pricked up their ears when the teacher announced the results of the final exam. Shoot for the moon. Shoot for the moon. Why only run for Senate? Why not shoot for the moon and run for president? A snowball's chance in hell. A snowball's chance in hell. You have a snowball's chance in hell of passing the English test. Lunatic. Lunatic. The dangerous lunatic was sent to the nearest medical institute. The Story Not long after the end of the American Civil War, a new and influential club was established in the city of Baltimore, Maryland. When an American has an idea, he directly seeks a second American to share it. Thus was formed the Gun Club. In a single month after its formation, it numbered 1,833 active members and 30,565 associate members. One condition was imposed as a sine qua non upon every candidate for admission to the club. The candidate had to either design a new type of firearm or perfect an existing one. The bigger the weapon, the better. It is but fair to add that these Yankees, brave as they have ever proved themselves to be, did not confine themselves to theories and formulae, but that they paid heavily with their own money to produce working prototypes of their designs. The core of the gun club included many former military officers and veterans, many of them well versed in the science of artillery. Their military weapons attained colossal proportions, and their projectiles, exceeding the prescribed limits, unfortunately occasionally backfired or malfunctioned. Most of the active members of the gun club bore the marks of their failed experiments. Crutches, wooden legs, artificial arms, and steel hooks were common sights at club meetings. It was calculated that, throughout the gun club, there was not quite one arm between four persons and two legs between six. 
In the early days, the gun club meeting hall thronged with activity. But as time went by and peace settled across the land, the gun club members became gradually more listless and bored. This is horrible, said Tom Hunter one evening, while rapidly carbonizing his wooden legs in the fireplace of the smoking room. When will we ever again hear the delightful sound of cannon fire? Those days are gone, said Jolly Billsby, gently petting his favorite revolver. It was delightful once upon a time. One invented a gun, and hardly was it cast, when one hastened to try it in the face of the enemy. The future of gunnery in America is lost, lamented the famous James T. Maston, scratching his head with his hook hand. The gentleman continued talking in this way, and it became apparent that the club was threatened with approaching dissolution. Fortunately, an unexpected circumstance occurred to prevent such a deplorable catastrophe. The next day, every member of the gun club received a letter from the club president, Impey Barbicane. It was a notification of a general meeting of the gun club to be held on October 5th. President Barbicane promised he would give an announcement of an extremely interesting nature. On the 5th of October, at 8 p.m., a dense crowd pressed toward the saloons of the gun club at number 21 Union Square. All the members of the association resident in Baltimore attended. Even many of the associate members from outside of state were there. The meeting hall was bursting at the seams with excited firearm enthusiasts. President Barbicane pushed through the crowd to the podium. Impey Barbicane was a man of forty years of age, calm, cold, and austere. He was as serious as a judge and as punctual as a clock. In a word, he was a Yankee to the bone. After taking his place at the podium, he delivered the following statement. My brave colleagues, too long already a paralyzing peace has plunged the members of the gun club into deplorable inactivity. I do not hesitate to state that any war which would recall us to arms would be welcome. The crowd cheered. But war, gentlemen, is impossible under existing circumstances. We therefore must find alternative venues in which to explore and practice our beloved hobby. The attendees pricked up their ears in curiosity. For some months past, my brave colleagues, continued Barbicane, I have been asking myself whether, while confining ourselves to our own particular objects, we could not enter upon some grand experiment worthy of the 19th century. I have been considering, working, calculating, and the results of my studies is the conviction that we are safe to succeed in an enterprise which to any other country would appear completely impossible. Gentlemen, we are going to shoot for the moon! The crowd became so excited that the entire city block erupted into shouts of hurrah! The attendees picked up Barbicane and carried him out on their shoulders. The following day, all the newspapers printed articles about the gun club, President Barbicane, and the moon. It was all anyone could talk about. It was as if the whole country had gone moon mad. But President Barbicane, calm as ever, embarked on the first phase of his project. He wrote a letter to the observatory in Cambridge, Massachusetts to inquire about facts and figures regarding the moon. From the esteemed astronomers at the Cambridge Observatory, he learned that the projectile would have to travel at 12,000 yards per second. It ought to be fired at 10.46 and 40 seconds on December 1st the following year, and that the cannon must be placed between 0 and 28 degrees north latitude. The next phase of the project involved designing the cannon, the projectile, and the powder. For this, Barbicane appointed a special committee consisting of the club's greatest minds, General Morgan, Major Elphinstone, 
J.T. Maston and himself. After President Barbicane opened the meeting, J.T. Maston asked if he could say a few words. Gentlemen, he began, the question of the projectile is the one we must answer first. The ball we are about to discharge at the moon is our ambassador to her. How glorious will be the moment when we shall launch our new projectile at the rapidity of seven miles a second! Overcome with emotion, Mr. Maston promptly sat down and dug into a huge plate of sandwiches. And now, said Barbicane, let's review the calculations for a cannonball of sufficient size to reach the moon. Yes, let's, replied the members, each with his mouth full of sandwich. Based on their calculations, if the cannonball were made of aluminum, it would need to be 9 feet in diameter and weigh 19,250 pounds. Fantastic, cried the Major, but do you know that at $9 a pound, this projectile will cost 173,050 U.S. dollars? Barbicane assured him that he was aware of the cost and that he was confident that it was within their means. The American public took a lively interest in the smallest details of the enterprise of the gun club. It followed day by day the discussions of the committee. Newspapers from across the country sent reporters to Baltimore to monitor the situation. But there was one man who was not a fan. His name was Captain Nickel, and he was a vocal opponent of the gun club's ambitions. Unlike Barbicane, who was an expert artillerist, Captain Nichols' field of expertise was armor, which made the two men natural enemies. It didn't help that they had similar personalities and equally strong opinions. This project has a snowball's chance in hell of working, Nichol wrote in the Baltimore Times. I'd be willing to bet $15,000 of my own money on it. Barbicane agreed to those terms. The gun club's moonshot was so famous by this point that it was relatively easy to raise the necessary funds. A grand total of five million four hundred and forty six thousand six hundred and seventy five US dollars was raised. The project then moved to Florida, where the enormous cannon was built and placed into the ground. There were some hiccups along the way, but the work was completed on schedule. Things were going well when President Barbicane received a most unexpected proposal. A French adventurer named Michel Ardon proposed to fly to the moon inside the shell of the projectile. Barbicane couldn't believe it. This man is a lunatic, he declared. Mr. Ardon soon arrived in Florida by ship. He was a tall, robust man in his forties. The love of the impossible constituted his primary characteristic. You are Barbara Kane, I suppose, said Michel Ardan as he stepped off the ship. Yes, replied Barbicane, and Mr. Ardan gave him such a handshake that he thought he was he would lose all his fingers. All right, shouted Ardan, let's light this candle. After a brief discussion, the two men came to an agreement. The shell would be redesigned so that Barbicane and Ardon could travel to the moon together. The next day, another surprising visitor arrived. It was none other than Captain Nickel, and he had some very hard questions for the pair of lunar adventurers. How do you plan to breathe up there? He asked Ardon, who had no answer to give. The only ignoramus bigger than you, accused Nickel, is that fool Barbicane. That was the last straw. Barbicane challenged Nickel to a duel, and he accepted. They met the following day at 5 a.m., armed for battle. But before the combatants could discharge their weapons, Ardan appeared and yelled, Stop, brave fellows, like you should not fight. But Nickel insisted on continuing the duel. Ardan shook his head and said, I have an attractive proposal to make that both of you will be eager to accept. His proposal was for all three of them to fly to the moon together. You will see for yourself that this is not a hoax, said Ardan to Nickel, 
and you will have a more balanced projectile with a third person, Ardon said to Barbicane. The two rivals shook hands and buried the hatchet right then and there. Soon, the first of December arrived. Nearly five million visitors came to watch the launch. As you can imagine, such a crowd of spectators created quite a stir. The hotels in the nearby town of Tampa were full, so most of them camped close to the launch site. As the hour of the launch drew near, the crowd grew silent as all eyes turned to the enormous cannon. The moment arrived for saying goodbye. The scene was a touching one. Barbicane was moved by J.T. Maston, who had found in his own dry eyes one ancient tear, which he had doubtless reserved for the occasion. Once inside the shell, the three travelers counted down the seconds. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Fire! No words can convey the slightest idea of the terrific sound that, that followed. An immense spout of fire shot up into the air. Some few spectators managed to catch a glimpse of the projectile victoriously flying in the air through the fiery vapors. Meanwhile, thousands of miles away in Colorado, Tom Hunter, a member of the gun club, was watching the whole event through the lens of a specially designed telescope. His job was to keep an eye on the shell as it made its way to the lunar surface. They have not yet reached the surface, Mr. Hunter told J.T. Maston three days later. I'm really worried that they may never reach their destination, he added. Mr. Maston sighed and said, Those three men have carried into space all the resources of art, science, and industry. With that, one can do anything, and you will see that, someday, they will come out all right. The Questions Number 1. How many total members did the gun club have? A. 30,565 B. 1,833 C. 32,398 D. 173,050 The answer is C. 32,398 This is a combination of active members and associate members, giving us the total members. Question 2. Why were the members of the gun club so listless? A. They didn't have any sandwiches. B. They didn't have enough guns. C. There was no war in which to test their guns. D. It was too hot in Florida. The answer is C. There was no war in which to test their guns. Question 3. What was Barbicane's proposal? A. To shoot a cannon at the moon. B. To destroy the moon. C. To carve the president's face on the moon. D. To shrink the moon. The answer is A. To shoot a cannon at the moon. Question 4. Which word best describes Michel Ardon? A. Bold B. Timid C. Listless D. All of the above The answer is A. Bold <laughs>